Believe it or not, our paper was actually inspired by a British philosopher, Bertrand Russell, who remarked on China's most important historical institution. Quote, at any rate, for good or evil, the examination system profoundly affected the civilization of China. Among its good effects were a widely diffused respect for learning. Unquote. The examination system to which Professor Russell referred is Keju. Keju is the most important institution in imperial China. It became the world's first meritocratic bureaucracy since the Song Dynasty, lasting for nearly one millennium prior to its abolishment. Because of the exceptional prestige and rewards conferred to those who had attained had the highest qualification, the Jing Shi, Keju attracted millions of zealous scholars to take the exam. We thus hypothesize that Keju had likely created a distinct group of elites with deep respect for learning and academic achievements, so much so that over time it fostered a cultural trade that has persisted even long after the exam's abolishment. In short, Keji provided us with an invaluable opportunity to study the possible persistence of institutions and culture combined in one single instance. We were curious as to whether the correlations that we found between the number of Jin Shi in the prefecture and the years of schooling today was merely correlation or historical academic success can in fact predict present preference for more education. For economists, correlations are not scientific enough because it may simply be the case that something we are unable to observe about a city or prefecture is producing the same effect over time. We were also curious about the mechanisms through which the observed persistent effects last over such a long span of time. The key challenge in our empirical study was to construct variables that can be used to proxy for the success of a prefectures in the Kirji exam. Given that Jin Shi is the highest attainable qualification, we thus enumerate the geographic distribution of Jin Shi scholars by hand for the entire Ming and Qing dynasty using historical Chinese archive. We then included a wide range of variables that might have a confounding effect on the years of schooling today. That was quite a bit of work. We found that an additional Jin Shi per 10,000 people has had the effect of increasing years of schooling by 0.87% in 2010, which is equivalent to nearly an additional year of schooling up to the mean of 8.72. Benchmarking this to a recent UN estimate, the magnitude is translated into an earnings difference of 1.5 times. Our finding is important because we are able to show with data how it was education rather than material wealth that is considered important to be passed on to the next generation in some cultures but not in others. To the extent that education matters for economic growth, it is the wealth of nations. Another key finding of our study pertains to the probable channels of transmission, of which we have identified four. Foremost is cultural transmission. Cultural traits could be transmitted vertically across generations within the family context through parental indoctrination and input. To find out, we connected the respondents of a panel survey with their Jin Shi ancestors, which exhibit a strong positive correlation with the followings. First, the perception that education is the most important determinant of social status. Second, the years of schooling parents expected the children to achieve. And third, the non-cognitive skills exhibited by the children aged 7 to 16. And then there are likely other channels. The first is educational infrastructure. Prefectures exiled in Keju may have established better educational infrastructure like Confucian academies in the Ming and Qing dynasties. By collecting additional data, we confirmed that Jinxi density is significantly correlated with both primary and middle schools when the civil exam was abolished and subsequently also the universities. The third channel is social capital. Upon becoming officials, Jinxi became social elites. As such, they created social capital by providing public goods through lineages and organizing philanthropic activities such as famine relief and orphanages. In fact, the effects lasted beyond the imperial dynasty as were manifested in a wide gamut of non-profit social organizations, including farmers associations, labor unions, chambers of commerce, and so forth. Finally, it's political elites. 
Upon becoming officials, the Jingshi also became political elites, and they may affect human capital outcomes today through plowing back resources into the community, some sort of regional favoritism. We found that to be the case not just in the late Qing, but also those in the Republican era that replaced them. But this effect vanished when China turned to communism and the political elites were no longer confined to those coming from a literati background. Data clearly presents a challenge for work of this nature. A lot of historical data are not readily available. You have to find the data first, followed by digitizing them. For an example, one referee asked us to check out the results using the data on Juren holder because the Jinshi holder are too far and few. But there were some 270,000 Juren in the Ming and the Qing period compared to just 45,000 Jinshi holder. And the raw data are scattered across prefectural gazetteers. So we had to organize an army of students to hand collect them. But data work are just onerous. As long as they lie somewhere on this planet, we can unearth them. Creativity poses another kind of challenge empirical economists often encounter. An example in this context was identification. We have to construct an instrumental variable to identify that the effects of Jin Shi is causal. To get around this, we use the average distance to the location and pi and bamboo as our possible IV, based on the rationales that reference books and exam A was crucial to Kerji exam success, and that pi was used for producing ink and bamboo for producing paper. We are extremely grateful to the judging panel led by Professor Carol Proper in awarding this prize to us. There are just so many great articles published in the EJ each year and being able to publish a paper there is already a huge honor. We never dreamed of winning the best paper award, so this is clearly a bonus to us. We hope that this will further encourage scholars down the road to devote their efforts to studying Chinese economic history. Thank you.